It's an interesting time to live. Never in the history of the world has there ever been less topsoil than there is today. Never in the history of the world have there ever been fewer mature trees than there are today. Never in the history of the world have there ever been less fish than there are today in clean air, in clean water. You know, a man by the name of David Orr at Oberlin College, he wrote a, a piece about the world. And he said, every day there are 116 square miles less rainforests every day. There are 72 square miles of more desert than there were the day before. There are 250,000 more people every day. Every day there are between 40 and 100 species that become extinct. And nobody in the world knows whether the number is 40 or 100. They have no idea what some of the species are that are going extinct. Every day we put 2,700 tons of CFCs into the atmosphere. We add 15 million tons of carbon into our atmosphere every day. David Orr says, every day the earth is a little hotter, the water is a little more acidic, and the fabric of life on planet earth is a little more threadbare. We are going towards the cliff at 200 miles an hour. The bureaucrats and the politicians are talking about we're going to organize the best health care in the world at the bottom of the cliff. We're going to save as many people as possible after they go over the cliff. Do you ever ask yourself the question, why is it why is it that we are not changing the road? You know, as, as we gather here today, less than one out of every four barrels of oil that we are using in the United States of America every day is produced in the United States. Our president goes over to Saudi Arabia and talks to him about increasing the production of oil, a million barrels of oil a day. But the problem is, they can't do it. They're running out of oil. The entire planet is running out of oil. As I stand in front of you today, if I was the emperor, if I had total power, if I could do anything that I decided could be done, it would be 10 years before I could add a refinery. It would be 10 years before I could add a nuclear power plant. But we could start conservation tomorrow. Do you ever ask yourself the question, why is it? Why is it that we are so bullheaded that we are willing to blindly follow and get into a war so that we can spend a billion dollars a week to protect a dwindling resource of oil halfway around the world. But we are unwilling to add to the mileage of the vehicles that are built in the United States. We are unwilling to invest in solar power, wind power. Where we're going 
is absolutely, totally non-sustainable. As we sit here tonight, there is no future for our children and grandchildren. It's as bleak as it has ever been. But we are acting like there is no problem, that we're going to come up with technology that is going to solve all of the problems that are out there. I just read a book, and the book was a, called Collapse. It was talking about the societies on planet Earth that flourished and disappeared because the people that lived there could not, could not deal with their environment. They could not understand the problems that were out there. They could not adapt. Many of you have heard of Easter Island. Easter Island was a beautiful place. It had rich soil, had trees, all kinds of fish, and the people that lived there had the most idyllic life in the world, and so they spent most of their time carving big statues, cutting down the trees so they could transport these statues of rock so that they could show that they were more powerful than their neighbor because their statue was bigger than the one before. But they could not understand that the boats that came to Easter Island brought a critter that did not live there before. They were rats. And there were not many of them, so they really weren't a problem. They didn't pay any attention to them, but those rats, the food for the rats happened to be the nuts from the palm tree. And the rats was eating the nuts of the palm tree and so new trees were not growing. But the people that lived there were doing so well and there were enough trees that they kept cutting them down and all of a sudden when they cut down the last tree, all of a sudden it dawned on them that there were no young trees coming along because the rats had eaten all of the nuts that had not reproduced and the trees had not started. And without the trees they could not build boats and without boats they could not fish. And they did not take care of their soil. And all of a sudden they were going hungry. And so this idyllic island was forced to cannibalism and they started eating each other because they could not, could not envision that their environment was collapsing around them. Do you think that the same thing is not happening here right now? In Iowa, 150 years ago, they started a church in Iowa, and all around the church was farm ground. And for the last 150 years, that church has been in continual use. And all of the land around the church for the last 150 years has been farmed. And today, that church stands a 10 feet taller than all of the ground around it because little by little, every year, there was less soil than there was the year before. And it only changed a quarter of an inch or a half an inch, and nobody noticed the difference. But all of a sudden, when you look over 150 years, they have lost 10 feet of topsoil. The United States of America we haven't been here for 300 years since the boat people arrived. And in 300 years, in the United States of America, we have lost 75% of all of the topsoil that was here when the boat people arrived. It takes over 500 years to produce one inch of topsoil. We haven't been here long enough to produce an inch, and we have lost three quarters of what we have. We have an area in the Gulf of Mexico today that is larger in the state of New Jersey that is absolutely, totally dead because of the herbicides, pesticides, and topsoil washing off of the central part of the United States. They used to say that a squirrel, 
that a squirrel could travel from the East Coast to the West Coast, from one tree to the other, and never put their feet on the ground. If you look at what we have done to the forest, the forests that are known as the lungs of the world, that one tree will have enough leaves that would have the same surface as 40 acres in one tree. And the tree is important if you like to breathe because the trees are known as the lungs of the world. They take the carbon dioxide out of the air and they replace it with oxygen. And it's important for us because we need oxygen. But we're cutting down the trees. Here we are in the state of Washington had some of the most beautiful forests the world has ever known. And if you drive down the road, you think that they're still there. Get up in an airplane and look down and you will see a little fringe of trees along the road and the rest of it is cut down, clear cut. When in God's world are we going to wake up to the fact that as a species, we are absolutely destroying the planet that we're living on. If you get Jared Diamond's book and you read it, Collapse, he talks about places like Easter Island or Tycho Pan. Tycho Pan was an, an island in the South Pacific, had everything they needed, and to tell how powerful an individual was, they would determine how many pigs that they owned. And all of a sudden, they looked on the island of Tycho Pan, and those pigs were absolutely destroying the environment. And all of the elders got together and said, we're either going to have to get rid of the pigs, or we as a society will not survive. They actually took the unprecedented stand of going out and eliminating all of the pigs on Tycho Pan. And today the society still exists on Tycho Pan because they were willing to look at their environment and understand what it was that was destroying it. Or if you go to the southwestern United States, we had a society of natives that were called the Ancient Ones. They had tremendous irrigation systems. They had large communities. They existed for well over a thousand years. But little by little, they kept cutting down the trees. They had to go further away. And all of a sudden, when they had cut down all of the forest, they had changed the environment to the point where they could not could not end up with snow in the winter time that was retained so that they would have water in the spring for their irrigation. And the ancient ones that survived for over a thousand years came to the point where they also became cannibals. And today the only thing we find is their cliff dwellings, their irrigation system, and they totally disappeared because they could not learn to live within their environment. Or if we take Greenland, the Vikings in Norway thought it would be a great place to move from Norway to Greenland, that they would start a new community there and they moved and they brought their cattle. And the status symbol of being really someone was how many cattle you owned. And they spent over nine months a year cutting down feed so they could store it, so they could get their cattle through the winter. They kept moving further north. And in less than 300 years, they destroyed the environment so bad that they had to abandon the entire society in Greenland and move back to Norway. If that could happen in Norway in 300, or in Greenland in 300 years, ask yourself, what's the time frame on the United States of America? 
We haven't even been here 300 years yet. 75% of our topsoil is gone. 90% of our old growth forest is gone. The largest underground aquifer in the world, the old Iguala. If we took all of the water that runs down the Colorado River that has run down for 18 years, it would take all of that water to refill the largest underground aquifer in the world because we're pumping water out to grow corn, to stuff it down the throat of an animal. So we, as citizens of the United States of America, can eat meat to the point right now where one out of every two Americans dying today is dying of heart disease. Main cause of heart disease, saturated fat and cholesterol. All cholesterol comes from animal products. No such thing as carrot cholesterol, cabbage cholesterol. You can't even mail order kale cholesterol. The majority of saturated fat comes from animal products. As we sit here tonight, one out of every three Americans will come down with cancer. One out of four will die of cancer. Two out of every three Americans today are considered to be overweight or obese. Diabetes is growing in this nation at a phenomenal rate. And the number one causative agent happens to be obesity. Why is it? Why is it that we cannot see that? We just came out with a new food pyramid from the United States Department of Agriculture. If you can figure out what the hell it's supposed to say, come and tell me. Why don't we tell the American people the truth? The proper amount of animal products to be in your diet should be zero. I stand in front of you tonight. I came from Montana. Montana is not the hotbed of vegetarianism. <laughs> my hometown newspaper, the Great Falls Tribune, put my picture on the front page and it said, Montana's most famous vegetarian. I picked up the phone and I called him up and I said, Donor, why don't you tell him the truth? Montana's only vegetarian. And they said, oh no, we have one of you kind of guys who works at the paper here, so we know there are two. <laughs> but you know, growing up in Montana, I was one of the first 300 pound football players in North America. I never found an animal product I wouldn't stuff down my throat because I thought I needed the protein, the iron, to go out on the field, knock the other guy down. And when I got done playing football, I kept eating the same way, and I got well over 300 pounds. My blood pressure was sky high, my cholesterol was over 300. I'd sit down and have lunch and my nose would bleed. It's a terrible thing to look down and see you have ketchup on your food and you don't even have a bottle of it on the table. I knew I was in trouble. But I was from Montana. I'd rather be caught riding a stolen horse than admitting to somebody I was thinking about becoming a v -v -v vegetarian. <laughs> Couldn't spell it, but I knew I ought to be one. <laughs> and so I became a closet vegetarian. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody about it. For a year, the world's worst closet vegetarian, lettuce and dairy products. I lost some weight. My dairy, my blood pressure went down slightly. My cholesterol went down slightly. I thought, wow, if I can do that, being the world's worst vegetarian, just think what I could do if I became vegan and I could spell vegan. <laughs> I became a vegan. I lost 130 pounds. My blood pressure went from sky high to normal. My cholesterol from 300 to 135. I'm telling you what, I thought I'd found the magic diet. I couldn't hardly wait. I wanted to share it with my friends, my family. My wife and I have been married over 37 years. 
Never one time in 37 years have I ever regretted marrying my wife. Now she can't say that, but I married better than she did. But I will tell you that she came with a mother that in 37 years has been a severe test. And here I am, I'm thinking of telling my mother-in-law about my diet that had the potential to extend her life. I thought about that for a long, long time. But I, I looked at it and said, that's the Christian way. I picked up the phone, I called my mother-in-law and I said, hey Marge, why don't you come over to our house for our Thanksgiving dinner? And she said, ah, you won't have turkey. I said, I'll tell you what, if you come to our house for Thanksgiving dinner, I guarantee you will have turkey. She agreed to come. She knew she had me eating crow. Thanksgiving day, my mother-in-law came in the house like a rocket. Immediately to the oven. She jerked open the oven, no turkey. She went to the refrigerator, no turkey. She even looked in the dryer, <laughs> no turkey. And she said to me, you guaranteed we'd have turkey. I took my mother-in-law by the hand. Luckily, I was wearing my gloves. I took her to the back door. I opened up the back door, and in the backyard, I had a live turkey. I gave my mother-in-law an axe. Not a real good idea to give your mother-in-law an axe. And I told her, I said, if you want turkey, you got to kill it. Now, this story has good news, bad news. The good news is that turkey's still alive. The bad news, so is my mother-in-law. But you know, I learned something. And when you would go to somebody and point at them and say, let me tell you about my diet, you could see their eyes roll up. You could hear their ears slam shut. They didn't want to hear what you had to say. It's not until somebody comes up and taps you on the shoulder and say, are you one of those V people that you have a 35 second window of opportunity of telling them why? And remember, it's a 35 second window of opportunity, not a three and a half hour dialogue. So I go about my life. And until somebody comes to me and asks me about my diet, I don't tell them anything about it. My wife and I, we graduated from high school in Montana, Great Falls High School. This year will be my wife's 50th class reunion. About one third of the people that graduated with her 50 years ago have already died. When you go there, you never saw so many people with canes, crutches, and walkers in all your life. They're all talking about their their latest operation, their favorite doctor, where you can buy the cheapest meds. But when my wife and I go there, they never come up to us and talk to us about our diet. You know, we walk in the door, the 50th class reunion. I weigh exactly the same thing I did when I was a sophomore in high school. Nobody wants to talk to me about my diet until I go to the bathroom. I walk into the bathroom and the first thing they do is they come up to me and say, do you ever sneak out to McDonald's and get a burger? Now what in the world are you going to tell somebody in the bathroom about their diet? Look them in the eye and say, oh, by the way, does your poop float? <laughs> you know, there's always a way of educating people. But we need to educate people. You know, I was raised in Montana during the Second World War. My parents, they couldn't hire any help and so my mother and father were milking cows. That meant my brother, two sisters and I were raised by my grandparents. Now back then, daycare is considerably different than it is today. No such thing as swing slides or Lego blocks. Back then, daycare was working in the garden. My first job, four or five years old, was working in the garden. 
putting my hands in real, live, living soil, birds, trees. I thought it was the Garden of Eden and I wanted to be a farmer. That was the only thing I wanted to do. My parents owned a farm. Twelve years I could go to school, I didn't do anything but party and play football. Never one time in twelve years did I ever take a book home. And believe it or not, my senior year, they came to me and they said, Lyman, you're going to graduate. Almost had the big one right there. And if you think I had trouble believing it, can you imagine what it was like for my instructors? Lyman's going to graduate. But I figured that out. They looked at it and said, this guy is so doggone dumb. If we don't graduate him, he might come back. They didn't want to take a chance on that. They graduated me. I was thrilled to death. I went home to that farm. That farm was a business to be run. I was dumber in a post. I thought, there's no way I'm going to make it as a farmer. So I immediately went to Montana State University. I went there because I wanted to be an agribusinessman. Now, I couldn't spell agribusiness, but I knew that's what I wanted to be. I learned about herbicides, pesticides, hormones, and medication. I soaked up that information like a sponge. I learned a thing that was called better living through chemistry. I bought that hook, line, and sinker. And I went home with a degree in agriculture and I said to my father, I said, move over, Pop. I'm going to take this one-horse farm and turn it into an agribusiness. And he said, what in the world is that? I said, man, didn't you ever hear of better living through chemistry? He said, wait a minute. Our job is to work with nature. And I said, no, that's old fashioned. We need to have herbicides, pesticides, hormones, and medication. We got to feed a hungry world. And so I took that farm. And over a period of years, I turned it into an operation where I had 7,000 head of cattle, 12,000 acres of crop, and 30 employees. I can't tell you what thrill it was the first time I wrote a check for a million dollars and it didn't bounce, and I thought, my God, I have arrived. I'm the Donald Trump of agriculture. Just when I was on top of the world, 1979, I got a wake-up call. I ended up paralyzed from the waist down. A doctor told me, he said, you have a tumor on your spinal cord. If that tumor's on the inside of the cord, you have less than one chance in a million you'll ever walk again. If somebody gives you the odd in one in a million, what they're saying to you is, hey, sucker, Pick out the wheelchair you like, you're going to be in it the rest of your life. And here I am in the hospital, flat on the back, and a lot of things going through my mind. It was not about having seven combines at $100,000 a piece, or 20 tractors, or 30 trucks. What kept going through my mind is why I became a farmer of birds, trees, and living soil. I was buying over $100,000 worth of chemicals a year. I saw the birds die, the trees die. I saw the soil change. And it was not until I was paralyzed that I was willing to admit that I was the problem, not the solution. And that night, I have to tell you, I thought I would be in a wheelchair the rest of my life. I wondered what kind of an invalid would I be? Would I be in a wheelchair and feel sorry for myself? Or could I actually make my life amount to something? And if I was going to do that, what would that something be? I decided that night, whatever the outcome was, I was going to spend the rest of my life trying to get that farm back to what it was when I was a kid with birds, trees, and living soil. They took me up and operated on me for 12 hours. I stand in front of you today, I have no bone on the back of part of my spinal column. And sure enough, the tumor was on the inside of the cord. They couldn't lift the cord up to get to the tumor. All they could do is pick a nerve and cut it. Hope the tumor was attached like a fish on a line. And they picked one, they cut it and took out a tumor the size of my thumb. I walked out of the hospital with a one in a million operation. Now. I didn't walk out of the hospital because of the skill of my surgeon. I didn't walk out because of the care in the hospital. I think I walked out of there by the grace of God. And I walked out of the hospital a much different individual than I went in. 
But I didn't walk out of there thinking I ought to be on a vegan diet. I thought it was all about less chemicals, that we needed to take care of the environment. From the time I was paralyzed until I recovered was about two years, 7,000 head of cattle, 30 employees. I'll tell you, the financial shape of my farm was dire. I went to see my banker and I said to my banker, I said, I need your help. We need to start farming with nature. My banker, he reared back in a chair and said, what the hell does that mean? I said, we need to become organic farmers. He said, you want me to lend you money? You're not going to spend it with my other customers, the chemical dealer, the pharmaceutical dealer, the fertilizer dealer? He said, there will never be a day like that. So 1983, I sold my farm. I paid my debts. I started working with other farmers not to make the mistakes that I made. 1987, I got a call. They said, how would you like to go to Washington, D.C. and work on Capitol Hill? I thought, wow, 535 members of Congress I just absolutely knew they wanted to do what was right. <laughs> I went to Washington, D.C. I spent five years working on Capitol Hill. If you remember nothing else that I say tonight, I'd like you to remember what I learned on Capitol Hill. I learned a thing called the Golden Rule. Them that got the gold make the rules. And after five years, I said to my friends, I said, this game is rigged. The deck is marked. We will never win in Washington, D.C. And they looked at me and they laughed. And they said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go talk to the people. They said, you're never going to get half of the people to do anything. I said, we don't need half. 80% of the people in the United States of America today are brain dead. They're part of the herd. They're following nose to tail. And if you follow nose to tail, there is only one thing you ever see in front of you. I said, what we need to do is find the 20% that are thinking. When we get the majority of those that are thinking, the herd will follow. And I'm telling you tonight, this generation is the most important generation that has ever lived in the history of the world because if we don't change the route we're going, we're going to get where we're going. And where we're going is absolutely, totally non-sustainable. You can talk about feeding the world and all of the chemicals and genetic engineering, anything that you want you can talk about, but it is not going to work because it takes 16 pounds of grain to stuff down the throat of an animal to put one pound of meat on your plate. 16 pounds of grain will feed 32 hungry people or one Rush Limbaugh, which is the best use of our resources. Now, I have to admit that some people come to me and say, wait a minute, we continue to feed meat to Rush might not be a bad idea. He may not get a whole lot older. I have to admit that's probably not a bad idea, but probably not the Christian approach. But when you stop and look at it as we sit here tonight, there are six billion people on the planet. Every night, 1.25 billion go to bed hungry, malnourished. At the same time, 1.25 billion go to bed every night, overweight, obese. When in the world are we going to wake up that the fork is the most dangerous weapon in the arsenal of the homo sapiens? We're digging more graves with our fork than any other tool. You know, I have people come to me and say, well, you know, I realize that there's a problem with the way we eat, but, you know, I'm only one individual. I'm not going to make a difference. You know, what do you expect me to do? Go out and change the world? Do you realize that every change in the world has always happened because of one person? I want to give you an example. The Civil War. 
North fought the South, and the North prevailed. The person that was probably more instrumental in the North winning the war was not even an American. He happened to be an Englishman. He was involved in the slave trade. And they were hauling Africans that were captured over to Central America and the U.S. as slaves. It was extremely profitable. He made a lot of money. Well, he had just finished del delivering a load of slaves. He was on his way back to England and they were in a terrible storm and they thought that the ship was going to sink. And this individual is there and he's praying to God and he said, Dear God, save me, save my ship, and I will change what I do. And sure enough, the ship survived. The man survived. And on the way back to England, he wrote a poem. And the poem was called Amazing Grace. Once I was blind, but now I see. And that poem was put to music and became so popular in England that they actually outlawed slavery in England. And mostly because the people became so attached to that song, Amazing Grace, that they never again in the British Empire would allow slavery. And along comes the Civil War. The business community in England wanted to support the South because they wanted the cotton. They needed it for their mills. But the South was involved in slavery and the people in England would not allow the government to recognize the South and without England recognizing the South, supplying them with what they needed, it was just a matter of time before the North prevailed. One individual made a difference. And what I say to you tonight is, I don't want you to walk out of here tonight and say, oh, hallelujah, I have heard the gospel according to Lyman. I want you to walk out of here tonight and say, that's the craziest ex-farmer I ever saw in my life. I wonder if he knew a damn thing about what he was talking about. I want you to come over here and buy my book. Oh, wait a minute. I want you to educate yourself. I want you to understand how dire the future is. You know, the propaganda minister in Germany during the Second World War, the father of public relations came up and said, you need to find the biggest lie you can find, tell it often enough and people will start to believe it. That's exactly what's happening in the United States of America that we're talking about, don't worry. The price of gasoline is over two and a quarter right now, probably well on its way to five or eight dollars a gallon, and we're being told not to worry. Where in the world is the common sense of conservation? When when are we going to provide the leadership? It's not by going on the corner and standing and hollering at somebody and saying, recycle. It's about living what you believe. Riding your bicycle, recycling, doing composting. This is what it's about. There's enough people here tonight to change this community. But you have to be a beacon. It's not what you say, it's about what you do. And if you think you can't change, look at what's standing in front of you tonight. 
a fourth generation farmer, rancher, feedlot operator. There's nobody in this audience that has consumed more meat, dairy, than I have. I damn near killed myself with my own fork. Ten of my friends used to come to my house in Montana and play cards. Of those ten, I was the only vegetarian. Of those ten, I'm the only one that hasn't had heart disease, cancer, or died. And seven out of my ten friends have already died. It is happening around us, it's happening right now. When in the world are we going to wake up? When are we going to give up on the big lie? When are we going to commit ourselves to the future so that there is a future for our children and grandchildren? I don't care what measurement you use, whether you want to talk about clean water, clean air. Do you realize as we sit here tonight, one out of every three people in China dying today are dying from the air they breathe and the water they drink? 30% of all of the Chinese are dying from the environment. The same thing is happening here. The average teenager in America today is consuming 64 teaspoons of sugar a day. Do you realize that when you go to 7-Eleven and get a 32 ounce big gulp, there are 32 teaspoons of sugar in one 32 ounce big gulp? Do you realize that a 12 ounce can, a 12 ounce can of soda has between 10 and 12 teaspoons of sugar in it. Do you know why there's not more? Because they can't keep it in solution. The diet in America today is absolutely, totally out of control. When people come to me and they say, okay, wise guy, if I let you take one thing out of my diet, what would it be? And the first thing I would say, if you're only going to take one thing out of your diet, it should be dairy. Do you realize that dairy, that 87% of the protein in dairy is a thing that is called casein? And they now know that when you end up with a critter that has cancer and they consume casein that it's like gasoline on a fire. But if you take the same person with cancer and you give them plant-based protein, they will thrive. First thing out of your diet should be dairy. And that's from somebody that was raised on the largest dairy farm in the state of Montana. The second thing that you want to take out of your diet is chicken. Oh, what would the colonel say? Do you realize, in my opinion, there's nothing that ends up with more chemicals, hormones, or antibiotics than chickens? that they actually grind up live chickens and feed them back to other chickens and then they go out and scrape up the manure and feed it to the chickens which gives a whole new meaning to finger licking good. First thing out dairy, second thing out chicken, third fish. If we look at farm raised fish it takes 20 pounds of wild sea life to produce one pound of farm-raised fish. The government, even today, will quietly recommend to the American people that any woman that is ever considering having a child should never eat fish because of the mercury in the fish. Eat the fish, store the mercury in your body, become pregnant, transfer it the mercury from your body to the brain of your fetus. Do you realize there are studies out there right now that show 
the children that are raised on a vegan diet have 16 extra IQ points than children that are raised on the standard American diet? And we're wondering where all of the ADD is coming from? It's about time. It's about time that we wake up. You know, on my farm in Montana, I had a disease in my cattle one time. And it was called TEM, thrombosis in meningitis. It was a virus that attacked the brain. It would raise the temperature of the brain for a few seconds. And it would cause the animal to become brain dead. Even though it was standing there perfectly healthy, it didn't know enough to eat or drink. For me, it was devastating. I lost a significant part of my herd. Financially, it was a crushing blow. In 1990, I heard about a problem in England that was called mad cow disease, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And I thought, wow, you know, the first time they've ever identified it was 1987. By 1990, it was an epidemic. I went to the Library of Congress, I looked it up, and it said slow-growing virus or bacteria. And I thought, wow, if that ever happened over here, it would absolutely wipe out the cattle industry. And so in 1990, I went around and I started talking to people about mad cow disease, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. At that time, people thought I was the one that had holes in my brain because they'd never heard of it. 1996, I was invited to go to England to testify in the McLeabel trial. Some activists that were handing out brochures in front of McDonald's, and McDonald's decided they'd make an example out of them, and so the little group, they only had 13 members. The majority of the members happened to be informants for McDonald's, and so they decided McDonald's was going to show the world that you couldn't fool with the golden arches. And so they decided they were going to sue the activists. All of them rolled over and played dead and said to McDonald's, if you won't sue us, we will, we will never, never again trespass on your property or hand out brochures. But there were two of them that wouldn't. Dave and Helen. They called me up and they said, High Court in England will allow you to come over and testify as an expert witness. Would you come over and appear in court? Now, my relatives came from Germany to England in 1066. They left England in 1630 and were one of the seven founding families of Hartford, Connecticut, and I always wanted to go to England, and so I said to them, whoa, I would love to come to England. Will you buy me a ticket? And they said, no, we don't have any money. I said, you mean I have to buy my own ticket? They said, yep. And I said, well, you get me a place to stay. And they said, no, you have to get your own place to stay. I said, would you feed me? And they said, no, we can't afford to do that. Now, with an enticement like that, <laughs> I mean, who would not go to England and testify? So I went to England. And lo and behold, when I showed up in England, the Minister of Health stood in front of Parliament and he said, we can no longer assure the English people that mad cow disease cannot be transferred from cows to humans. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association said it was the exploding powder keg heard around the world. I was the only person from the United States and England that was willing to talk about the problem. I did 70 press conferences in nine days. 
the hotel I was staying in, they turned the breakfast room into a press gallery. Italian television came, set up their lights, their cameras, I did an interview, they took down their camera, and along came CBS, and I did an interview with Dan Rather, and then NBC, ABC, French television, and then BBC sent a limo to take me down to do world service tonight. I walk out of the hotel, here's a limo with a guy with a blue suit and a limo driver's hat. He jumps up, opens the door for me. I told him, I said, if you ever do that again, I'll break your arm. I'm a farm boy, I'll open my own door. He took me down to BBC radio. I'm talking to the producer and I said to him, I said, how many stations is this on? He said, I don't know, but we're in over 200 countries, a few thousand stations. Wow, I go there as a farm boy. I become a celebrity. I do an hour on World Service tonight. I walk outside because I'm going to BBC television next. My limo is waiting for me. Needless to say, the driver did not open the door for me. I get in, BBC televisions directly across the street. We do a U-turn. I said to him, I said, hell, I could have walked over here. I go in, do BBC television, get back in my limo, go back to my hotel, seven newspapers waiting to interview me. It goes like this day after day. Finally, I fly back to New York City. I get off of the airplane. I'm flying, I'm walking down the runway, and over the loudspeaker I heard, Howard Lyman pick up a white paging telephone. Well, being a celebrity, I looked to my entourage. I was alone. I pick up the phone, it's Oprah Winfrey. She says, how would you like to come to Chicago? We want to do a show that's called Dangerous Food. Could it happen here? She says, you'd be able to appear in front of a few million people. Well now, do you think I jumped at that opportunity? I waited a good four or five seconds. <laughs> Being a celebrity, you know, I agreed to go. They sent me a ticket. I flew to Chicago. I get off of the plane. I'm walking down the runway. I'm carrying my suit. Here's a guy in a blue suit and a limo driver's hat. Got a big sign and the sign says Lyman. Oh, I go up to him and I said, can you wait five minutes? I want to find somebody with a camera. I want to get a picture of this. He said, no took me out and put me in a limo, and I swear to God, this is true, that limo was so long I had a phone to talk to the driver. Luckily, the windows were frosted. I was embarrassed. They took me down and put me in a suite. The suite was larger than the home I was raised in with my parents, two sisters and a brother. Next morning, I'm up bright and early. I got my suit on. My limo is waiting. I meet Oprah Winfrey for the first time. I walk in, Oprah comes up to me and says, you know, I saw the movie Babe five times. I will never again eat pork. I looked up and said, oh Lord, it's gonna be a good day. <laughs> well, I need to tell you guys that if you're gonna appear on television in front of a few million people, it's your wife's responsibility to call you up in the green room and tell you exactly what to say. I'm in the green room, the phone rings, it's my wife. She tells me exactly what to say. I'm thinking about it. They come and get me, take me out, put me on the stage. To the right of me is a grandmother whose granddaughter is dying in the human form of mad cow disease in England. To the left of me, a guy from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Going through my mind is what my wife said to me. She said, remember, don't say anything stupid. Now, I'm trying to figure out whether there's a comma in that sentence or not. <laughs> but before I can figure that out, Oprah Winfrey comes out, points at me, and says, here's a man who believes within 10 years we could have a disease that would make AIDS look like the common cold. And I said, absolutely. Oprah said, that's a strong statement. I said, Oprah, we have 100,000 cows a year, fine at night, dead in the morning. We round them up, grind them up, turn them into feed, feed them back to cows. We collect roadkill, deer, elk, possum, raccoon, grind them up, feed them back to cows. And then we take pets, euthanized pets. 
full of chemicals that were used to kill them, dogs and cats. City of Los Angeles alone, 200 tons of dogs and cats a month are ground up, turned into feed, fed back to our pets or our food animals. Oprah's eyes are as big as saucers. I know I got her. She turns around and looks at the guy from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and says, Dr. Weber, are we feeding cows to cows? He said, well, you know, um, uh, a, a limited amount of that's going on. Near as I can tell, 95% of the cattle fed in factory feedlots are eating the remains of other animals, and he calls it a limited amount. And then Oprah, the next damn thing out of her mouth, gets a suit. She said, that just stops me cold. I will never again eat a burger. Now, she didn't say to the millions of viewers, you shouldn't eat a burger. She didn't say, I think the meat's infected. She just said, that stops me cold. I will never again eat a burger. Now, before I went on that show, I checked with a good friend of mine who's a lawyer here in Seattle because 13 states had a thing that was called a food disparagement law. And the food disparagement law says it's against the law to say something you know to be false about a perishable commodity. Now, I didn't say anything I knew to be false. Everything I said, I fully believed to be true. I wasn't worried about it. We're taping the show. It takes a couple of hours. When we get done, I walk up to Oprah Winfrey and I said, Hey, Oprah, give me 10 minutes. I'll get you off of chicken. And Oprah looks at me and says, only one animal a day. Well, I go about my business. I'm not worried. I told the truth. A few weeks later, I get a call from a national news magazine said, by the way, do you realize you're getting sued along with Oprah Winfrey and Harpo Production by a group of Texas cattlemen? I said, no, I didn't know that. I said, can I put you on hold? I put them on hold. I raced into my library. I inventoried my vegetarian cookbooks. I knew those cattlemen wanted those vegetarian cookbooks bad. I went back and said, I can't talk to you now. I got to put in a call to Oprah. I called, left a message for Oprah. I said, hey, Oprah, we lose this suit. You got to put up the money. I'm going to throw in my vegetarian cookbooks. Now, I don't know how many of you know it, but I have a doctor of law degree. I know a couple of things about the law. The first rule of law is never sue anyone who has nothing. That's me. Second rule of law, never sue anybody that talks to millions of people a day. That's Oprah. Well, shortly after we did that show, USDA, FDA did exactly what I called for. They banned the feeding of cows, sheep, and goats. I thought, sure, we'd go to Amarillo, Texas. The judge, a 72-year-old lady, a tough old heifer, I thought, sure, she'd pick up the hammer, slap it down, and say, case dismissed. I go to Amarillo, Texas. I couldn't hardly believe it. 25% of all the cattle that are fed in the U.S. come from around Amarillo. The largest employer in Amarillo is a slaughter facility killing cattle. Bumper stickers all over town said the only mad cow in Texas is named Oprah. I knew we were in trouble. I went to my lawyer and I said, you know, we need a change of venue. We went to that sweet little old judge and said, Your Honor, we'd like a change of venue. She picked up the hammer, slapped it down, said, Motion denied. Bring in the jury pool. 140 people walked into the courtroom. You never saw so many hats, boots, and belt buckles in your life. I leaned over to my lawyer and said, We better write the appeal today. I don't think we got a chance. End of the day, we had 12 jurors absolutely steeped in the cattle culture. I'm talking to my lawyer and he said, you know, the plaintiffs and their attorneys are down in the bar right now laughing and giggling that there are not 12 people in the state of Texas that could be put on a jury to find a vegetarian not liable. He said, they're going to call you to the stand. His first question they're going to ask you, is it not true that you are a vegetarian? I said, I can handle that. He said, you damn well better or we're going to lose. Sure enough, they call me to the stand. First question is, Mr. Lyman, is it not true that you are a vegetarian? 
I looked at the jury and said, I will not apologize for that that has saved my life. And the jury is over there nodding their head, never again in that trial did we talk about me being a vegetarian. But they asked me every question you could think of day after day. I'll never forget. The plaintiff's attorney looks at me and he said, Mr. Lyman, has anybody ever called you irresponsible? I said, yes. I look over at my lawyer. He's going, no, no, no. The plaintiff's attorney thinks he's found the key to the Gordian knot. And he said, who? I said, my wife. The jury's sitting over there, have huh? been there, done that. Well, we're in that courtroom for six weeks. At the end of six weeks, that jury found Oprah, Harpo Production, and myself not liable. The cattlemen could not believe that. They immediately appealed it to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. We're in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals for over a year, and they come down with a unanimous panel decision that Oprah, Harpo Production, and myself are not liable. And then they said in their opinion that everything I said on that show was true, and the truth is not actionable. The cattlemen asked for that to be reheard. It was denied. And then they turned around and sued Oprah, Harpo Production, and myself in Texas State Court. Spent six years in court. Hundreds of thousands of dollars defending ourselves. And let me tell you, when somebody gives you lemons, make lemonade. We started out with a few million people that heard about the case. And by the time we finished after six years, millions and millions of Americans knew about it. So I say to you, you never know. You never know when you're going to have the opportunity. Who would have ever thought somebody raised on a cattle ranch would be involved in telling people that what we are doing in agriculture today is absolutely, totally non-sustainable? Genetic engineering. When you end up with monarch butterflies eating the pollen on genetically engineered corn, they die. Monarch butterflies have been eating the pollen off of corn for eons and no problem. But the minute we start genetically engineering, for some reason it kills monarch butterflies. The first genetically engineered product that comes onto the market for Homo sapiens happened to be a thing that's called L-tryptophan. When we consumed L-tryptophan that was produced naturally, no problem. When they genetically engineered it, we ended up with over 100 people died, thousands of people were crippled. And so I say to you tonight, it is so clear that where we're going is a disaster. This is not about having a big car. This is not about a beach house. This is about the future of our children and grandchildren. This is about surviving on planet Earth. And so, I would like to say to you tonight, get involved. Read. Figure out what's going on. Get involved. What a tremendous opportunity tonight to go around and visit with people that have committed themselves to help educate people to making changes. I started out, I was going to make a change because I thought it was all about organic. It was about that we should use less chemicals. I stand in front of you tonight, the reason I'm a vegan is because I know that no animal has to die for me to live. Never again in my life do I want to be involved in being responsible for an animal dying. Every time we reach into our pockets, every time we bring out our wallet, every time we spend a dollar, we're voting on the future. 
What kind of a future do we want? You know, I wrote the book Mad Cowboy. Now, it's been reprinted over 12 times. It has been translated into Polish, Korean, Japanese. We just signed a contract with the Chinese. Who would have ever thought? You're fortunate tonight because I have a few copies. Be more than happy to share them with you. I also have a documentary that I worked on for years, the story of my life. It has the best legal slaughterhouse footage in the world. One of the major companies in America came to me and they said, if you will take the slaughterhouse footage out, we will help you merchandise this. And I refused to do it because I really think it's important that if you're going to support the slaughter industry, you ought to see what it's like. I now produce DVDs so that people can share them with folks that don't show up, that won't come to a lecture, that you can take and show it in their living room. Your job, every time you look in the eye of a child, your job is to realize that if there is to be a future, it's up to you. I applaud the people that came together and made this event happen. They gave so much so that we could have the opportunity of coming together. I have never, never in my life seen the future as being as bleak as it is right now. But there's nobody in the world that is, is more upbeat than me because I know that there is only one thing in the world that changes human behavior, and that is crisis. And we have a crisis. It is what we need. There has never been a time in human history that as many people have had the opportunity of getting involved and making their voice heard. Don't sit on the sidelines. Get involved. Educate yourself. And when somebody comes along and taps you on the shoulder and say, are you one of the V people? Be prepared to give them a 35 second window sermon. 35 seconds, not a three and a half hour dialogue. I want to thank you for coming tonight. I want each and every one of you to come and pick up one of my business cards. They're on my table. On the back of my business card happens to be the address of my free electronic newsletter, which will give you the information to help people make a change. On the front is my email address. If you need my help, let me know. I will do what I can. I care about you. I care about the future. I realize that each and every one of you tonight had all kinds of opportunities in what you could do. I applaud you for the fact of coming. Let's get together. Let's change the world, even if we do it one bite at a time. Thank you very much.